do is they'll just pull out the brown stuff and yeah. cover some mulch with yeah. 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 Mike, your Tesla's not the one that caught fire and made it in the papers, is it? <laughs> no. I, I haven't driven over any metallic objects. that rip your battery up and burn your car? <laughs> that would be a bad yeah. mistake. Yeah, pretty much. Here we go. Yeah, it's you hear the water tower? So Elon Musk oh, on the interface. sent out an email to all the owners to let yeah. you know it's much safer than any gasoline-powered car there is, so <laughs> much more fire than gasoline. That was the gasoline-powered car that I saw that news article. So, yeah.
Most of you do a little more than I did, but basically not much, and sort of to teach us is from the beginning up on this presentation. Thanks for coming. Thanks very much for inviting me. It's uh, my first time in Seattle, believe it or not. I was shocked to see Starbucks here. <laughs> um, um, so we were talking about the topic, um, and it will come to you. Uh, as a sort of surprise at how much progress we have made in um, treatment of COPD without any medicines and without any surgery. Uh, most of the treatments that I'll talk about today are um, still undergoing research in the United States, but in Europe and Asia, they're already being implemented, clinically approved, and being used. So when I go to Europe to teach or just hang out with my friends at different hospitals, but that's all I do. It's my vacation. I will go to Europe and work for another week in some other hospital. Um, we do these procedures there. And there are so many of those, and they're rapidly approaching the U.S. Within probably the next couple of years, you will see not one, two, or three, but several options for treating COPD bronchoscopically, depending on what sort of COPD the patient has. This is my disclosure. I have uh, a, I've been PI or IMPI right now for uh, these trials. And this is what CHEST has taught me to the third slide, that I will not discuss anything off label. So you, you all are very well aware of the impact of COPD. Uh, two of the worst uh, and uh, most prevalent diseases in the world in pulmonary diseases are COPD and asthma. If you combine those, we're talking tens of millions of people in U.S. and a uh, lot more in the world. 
And the the worst part of and the biggest difference between these two diseases or one of the worst parts of COPD is or emphysema is that it's irreversible uh, for the most part. And even if people stop smoking after a certain point, the deterioration takes a while to balance out and then they may go back to the same deterioration rate which is based on the age of any healthy person, but the, 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 the damage that has been done is done. That damage never recovers. So the damage at an early age plus the decline with the age eventually leads to a very detrimental state of these patients. So you would see patients telling you that I stopped smoking 20 years ago and why I'm getting so symptomatic now. I was okay 10 years ago because now the age-related decline has caught up. I'm surprised on the first bullet point there. Three million seems to me actually remarkably low yeah, compared to what we say for asthma. Yeah, so these are the numbers. These are, I probably should just severe emphysema. So they are golden stage four and three, very severe asthma. The reason we quote three million is probably the reason because these are the patients who are eligible for our treatments. So there are two primary types of emphysema from the mechanical standpoint when we talk about treatment. One is the heterogeneous and other is the homogeneous. So heterogeneous is where uh, the lobes are primarily affected in the upper part or the upper lobes are affected and lower lobes are not as severely affected. Homogeneous, on the other hand, involves all three lobes on the right and all and both lobes on the left. So uh, they're just two different types. Alpha-1 interdriptin deficiency, which makes a very small portion, falls into the group of heterogeneous emphysema. So what we learned from the NET trial, which was a major trial that was carried out to do the surgical lung volume reduction uh, was that it worked best in heterogeneous emphysema where it was mostly the upper lobes that were involved and in patients who had a severe limitation of their exercise capacity. So if we did lung volume reduction surgically on those, on those patients, uh, they had a improvement of quality of life and improvement in their breathing parameters, and when compared to different interventions of these patients at their age, it was just as good, almost as good as changing the heart valve. So their prognosis was just as good. So this is the group of people, upper low predominant and high exercise, and low, mostly low exercise and then high exercise tolerance. So this is just the, these are just the results that uh, if the patients were symptomatic and they were upper lobe predominant, emphysema intervention with surgery worked very well. Their FEV1s improved and their PFPs improved with exercise improvement. Their quality of life improved, as I mentioned, comparable to heart valve replacement. So there was a significant sur survival advantage if patients got a um, treatment with surgical lung volume reduction in very highly selected group of patients. Now, I must tell you that surgical volume reduction, you don't hear about it a whole lot because it's not extremely, uh, it's not extremely common as you would expect. You would, you would say, well, if people get so much benefit, why don't they all go through surgery and get their upper lobes taken out when they have such a severe emphysema if their quality of life improves, their oxygenation and exercise tolerance improves? The problem was the comorbidities and mortality of the surgery. In a, a 60, 70, 80 year old man or woman who has a TV one of less than one <coughs> year, doing a major thoracotomy, removing a one or both sides, one lobe on each side, putting chest tube was a very, very big deal. These patients had very high mortality. So uh, operative mortality anywhere between four to seven percent. Even in the NET trial, National Emphysema Therapeutic Trial, 
there was a mortality of 5.5%. So you can imagine even in the stringest, the stringest of criteria in the studies with the best of the centers in the country and world, they had such a high mortality. And then morbidity of patients with persistent air leaks and persistence of bronchopleural fistula, which is um, very high. And look at the average hospital stay. So when it came out in early 90s or late 80s, even Medicare after a while stopped paying for it because it became so expensive to take care of these patients for a surgery which had, you know, not a very significant outcome. So, and then that trial was done in late 90s, early 2000s, and it was approved again uh, for a highly selective group of patients. The reason I discussed that is because we learn a lot from that in terms of how to design our bronchoscopic non-surgical therapies for patients, especially in patient selection. So we knew that if we do it bronchoscopically, we will bypass lots and lots of those complications. No thoracotomies, no chest tubes, no bronchopleural fistulas. So we knew that our post-op would be very much more successful and patient-friendly, but would we have the same success in terms of the outcomes? So you can see the list of things, or list of different modalities that were tried. And I'll go in, in detail in all of them uh, to give you a very good idea of where we're heading now. So for heterogeneous Emphysema, we had all of these plugs and blockers came probably about, about 10, 11 years, 12 years ago from Japan, and then we moved on to the treatment that we're now doing in terms of oils and sealants, and then we had bypass surgery. Some of these trials failed. Some of them uh, are still being worked on and looking very promising. This is one of the earliest things that we call, they look like little... Um, wine bottle cork, but it's made of silicone. It has little dots on the sides. And what this does is, you, what you do is basically you grab it from here with biopsy forceps, and you literally go into the airway and shove it, which is really hard. So the um, whole concept is, in bronchoscopic lung volume reduction, that there are some areas where there is a trapped air. And every time we breathe in, more air goes and traps him. And it doesn't come out very good, very well, because there is not much recoil in that portion of the lung. It's been damaged by chronic smoke. All the elastin fibers and all the smooth muscles are completely destroyed there. So they don't have so much recoil. Now, how do we fix it? Surgically, we just remove the portion of the lung, which was hyperinflated with, with a dead space air. We surgically removed it, so now we have more space for the healthier lower portion of the lung to go up and fill up the space. And also, by removing the, the sick portion of the lung, we redirected the circulation to the healthier part of the lung, so our VQ improved and our ventilation uh, and the um, sense of well-being improved in the patient because they were not breathing into dead space. With this technology and others I will discuss shortly, the airways were blocked off. So now there's no, no air going into those, in those areas of the damaged lung. So we looked at the CT, we discussed it with the radiologist, and the radiologist said, based on the CT criteria of the density of the lung and the damage of the lung, these are the target areas. If you block them, we often did VQ scans in these patients, too, to figure out how much VQ is going Ventilation and perfusion matching is going on in those areas of the lung. And we were not surprised to see that there was very little happening in those areas of the lung. What they were doing, though, they were hyperinflated, so they were pushing on the healthier lower parts of the lung. So not only they were not participating in, in breathing, they were hampering the breathing from the healthier lower portions of the lung. So if we place something which will allow air to come out from there slowly, from those dead spaces, and prevent further air from going, then they would gradually shrink and even collapse. And the healthier portions of the lung and the lower parts of the 
chess cat, we would have more space to expand and do their job. And if the ventilation stops in the upper part, the circulation will eventually stop. This will stop too, and circulation will be redirected automatically to the lower lobe because oxygen, uh, blood follows oxygen in the lobe. So we place these valves. Um, these are called Watanabe spigots. It's invented by Dr. Watanabe from uh, Japan. Um, and it's funny, when he was developing it, I was training in Hiroshima, and he, I used to go to his hospital to work, and we all used to play with it and make fun of it. And he used to say, oh, it would be great for my wine bottle after I'm done drinking half of it. Um, but he actually developed it and did several trials. Um, it was a very simple technique to place it, and his initial trial showed some improvement in vital capacity and FEV ones, but there were two issues that he still contends with. Um, I was there last year for his meeting, and uh, he's still having issues. Number one is post-obstructive pneumonia, and number two is migration. Migration is more than post-obstructive pneumonia. So it it's often falls off, and patients are coughing and um, moving a lot. It doesn't stay in place as good as lots of other modalities. Then came these valves. They are ductile valves. As you can see, the tiny valves allows air to go in. So they're unidirectional valves. Uh, you grab them, or there is a device that allows you to place them into the airways, leading to those damaged areas of the lungs. So these valves will allow the air to come out, but not go in. So this was the initial uh, iteration, and then they modified it to this valve which has a similar uh, mechanism, similar company, still called Zephyr, but this is easier to place and easier to remove. Because we wanted to make sure that we're able to remove these valves. When patients develop post-obstructive pneumonia or patients develop major atelectasis or as a result of atelectasis then develop pneumothorax. So these are, and then and th this is how they look when they're placed in the lung. You can see the valve is open, allowing air to come out every time patient breathes out. But when patient tries to breathe in, these valves prevent the air to go in. And they are placed bronchoscopically, along with bronchoscope goes a, what we call deployment device, which uh, deploys the stents very easily through a, um, in, in a, in a conscious sedation, patient under conscious sedation, or propofol, uh, a simple flexible bronchoscopy. Um, and they did a very big trial called BENT trial. Uh, we all did it in the United States, too. I was PI at the University of Pennsylvania for their trial. And we did, actually, no, I didn't pursue in that study. So they did 321 patients. All the patients first had pulmonary rehab to optimize their uh, clinical status and optimize their uh, pulmonary functions, and then they were randomized to either a medical management or Zephyr or, or um, endobronchial valves. 220 patients got valves with a two-to-one randomization, and 101 patients uh, went to optim optimal medical therapy. Did they have a sham bronchoscopy? In this, in this, I, I, I don't think they did. I didn't participate in this study, so I don't remember. Um, I don't think they did. Um, it was a very early trial. Um, this was back in 2003 or so, 2002 or three. Um, their, their primary endpoints were, or co-primary endpoints were FEV1 change in FEV1 and six-minute walk. And they, they achieved both of those. Um, but the problem was that they had too many complications, uh, including pneumothoraces. What happened, which was a little bit unexpected uh, for them and for all of us who were watching them from distance, was that you place the valve and um, the air, which is already there, uh, tries to come out, doesn't come out as good, and some of the air still leaks in for the first day or two, and then the lungs basically just pop and they would have a large pneumothorax and tension pneumothorax. So that led to 
some complications, and we learned a lot of lessons from them. So now our, our newer studies uh, have minimal to, to none um, of those complications. Um, so regardless, after that trial, uh, FDA was not very happy. They said the risk is, uh, is not acceptable. The complication rates are not acceptable. The motorities and exacerbation of the emphysema. So it was not allowed uh, for clinical use in the United States. However, it was approved in Europe and has been done there for the last 10 years, and they haven't had very many complications. Uh, they did do many more studies in Europe, and they were able to uh, decrease their complications dramatically, and it was very straightforward. Uh, they just need to really do it again in the U.S. and uh, get it approved. The other product, Spiratia, which is uh, what we all participated in the U.S. a lot, this valve looks like a little umbrella. Um, and these sharp sort of uh, spike legs of these, um, this umbrella goes into the tissue of the lung and buries in there and holds it in place. And this valve is like umbrella when you're holding it on your head. When air blows, the umbrella opens even more so it doesn't the air doesn't go up, your umbrella may even break, but it won't let the air go through it. And when the rainwater comes from above, it allows the water to go through on the sides. Not through, but on the sides. So if you put this facing towards the main airway, when air tries to go in during inspiration, it will expand and prevent air from going in. The thing from all the secretions and trapped air would be, would be able to come out from ground. And I'll show you a video of that. This is just a detail of a structure of how this is made because we all played with it and the first generation came out, didn't have these anchors and we suggested to put anchors so it holds well in the airway. And again, it's all simple bronchoscopic procedure. And you put this sheet, which is loaded with valve, through the working channel of the bronchoscope and then you go to a designated area based on CT in the map of the lung and you deploy it there. And this is how it's done. So your bronchoscope goes as far as it can, and then the loaded sheet goes through the working channel of the scope and comes out from the bronchoscope. You take it where you exactly want to deploy the valve, which is all predetermined based on the CT maps, and you deploy it. And they're not very difficult to deploy or remove. So see how secretions can come out. So that reduces the chance of post-obstructive pneumonia or air trapping and pneumothorax. And that's why this technology had less pneumothoraces. And we did a huge pilot trial and then a pivotal trial. And now we're going into our final phase, uh, which will take us to FDA in a year or two. Other good thing about this valve and the uh, vent trial was also that they are all re removable. So if we had um, a major problem of post-obstructive pneumonia or continuous collapse of bronchial fistula, we can remove it. Um, I think out of hundreds of these valves that I've placed, only five were in the same patient that I could never remove. I tried and tried and tried and I couldn't. Uh, they mi had migrated distally so far that I couldn't even see them, which is extremely rare. But other hundreds of valves that I've placed, I can see them, and whenever I want, I can remove them. And I've removed some of them. I'm surprised you don't fight rows or there is and then usually, get hard to remove. Yeah. There, there is usually a significant granulation. Here's the removal of one of the valves. So you can see the little tip of the, um, what we call the holding um, rod, so we're trying, we're holding the rod with our forceps and gradually pulling it. There we go. So you're right, uh, there is usually some granulation around it, uh, and it's not as easy to remove, uh, especially if they have been in there for a long period of time. Uh, but usually it's within, um, within a matter of weeks to months, we know whether they're working or not or they're causing any major complication and we remove them. 
That's How come you don't get bronchiectasis at the out, outflow of these valves? Because you'd think they wouldn't have an effective cough there, but they're going to pool secretions on the proximal side of the valve. So why don't they get bronchiectasis? Um, most of these patients don't have valves for long enough to de start developing scarring and bronchiectasis. They do develop sometimes post-obstructive secretions, post-obstructive pneumonia. Now, as you saw in this valve too, it allows the secretions to come out to the best. In most of the studies, and we are only in the study phase in the United States, we haven't started clinical use, we, put, we give them antibiotics a week or two before we do the valves. So we do CT scans, make sure there are no secretions, there is no post-obstructive problem, there is no existing bronchiectasis, uh, and there is no pneumonia in there. Then we give them antibiotics, and then we place a valve, and then we follow them very closely. If something starts to develop, the current pneumonia is a problem, bronchoporofistulus, we remove the valves. And this is how they look. This is one of my patients where I um, went crazy and placed six or eight valves. Now, in the U.S., these valves are not approved for COPD or emphysema, but they are approved for persistent post-surgical bronchopleural fistula. So if you have a patient who had bats and has persistent fistula, and this patient is not good for surgeon to go back in and repair the fistula, which most of the patients are not in my service at least, um, number one, surgeon knows exactly where he operated, so he can precisely pinpoint, tell me where is the most likely source of the airway that's going to that segment where the fistula is. And second, we put balloons in these airways, and see if their chest tubes are still bubbling. So when we place the balloon in the right airway and expand the balloon, it stops the bubbling of the chest tube, which, which tells us that which airway is leading to that portion of the lung where the fistula is, and then we place valves there. And it's been extremely successful. We have written two or three major publications on that, and FD has approved the humanitarian use of these valves in those patients. This was our study that we did, published in 2010. You will see half a dozen people from Penn and uh, Penn Group. Um, so again, this was the pilot study, upper lobe predominant, severe um, emphysema, FEV ones, less than 40, 50%, just like the NET trial. Patients who were not on um, surgical lung volume reduction surgery list. Now, Initially, for the study purposes, we said patients who were going for lung transplant, we would not include them. But now, as it turns out, it is one of the best way to keep those patients going, patients going until they get qualified for lung transplant, patients who are on the waiting list, who are in the worst of the shape. So this has become, in Europe and Asia now, a bridge therapy between severe emphysema and lung transplantation. And the good thing is, it's not a surgery, so we're not going through pleural space and destroying the pleura and destroying the lung and causing pleurodesis, which would affect lung transplant in the future. So in this study, we placed 609 valves. As you can imagine, each patient, each lobe could get several valves to block every tiny small airway. So 91 patients, 609 valves, not very hard to place. Uh, quickly, you know, 6.7 6 valves. The whole procedure took anywhere between an hour, hour and a half. Most of these procedures were done under general anesthesia, but the goal was to be able to do them under conscious sedation. And now I do them in conscious sedation for my DP fistula patients because I want their effort. I want them to cough and tell me if the air is still leaking from, into the chest tube. Um, no major expectoration, migration of the valves. And we saw that the end point was St. George's respiratory questionnaire. We saw that by the end of one year, 63% of the patients had significant change in their SGRQ. Actually, by the, by the end of one year, about double, they had double the improvement in their respiratory questionnaire, which is our primary endpoint, than we expected and which was required to call them responders. Sir, go ahead. On the previous slide, you show a hospital stay of 33 days. Is that an outlier? Yes. What, oh, yeah, big time outlier. Right. So that... usually, usually their um, um, hospital stay was overnight. Okay. Very few stayed through that. 
you, do you uh, maximize medical therapy? Do you insist in, that people stop smoking before you would do these procedures? For the clinical trial, yes. I don't know in the real life if we'd be able to do it or not. For clinical trial, we not only made sure this job, we did the blood test to make sure there was there are quarantine levels were low or zero. Uh, but in real life, um, I don't know if we will be able to do it. It's like, you know, lung volume reduction surgery. This stop smoking for two days and they'll be back on it. Um, and uh, my, our fear was that they will do more with this because this is such a minimally invasive surgery. So um, they will still do it. Um, so it's significant improvement at 12 months in SGQ or SGRQ. And now if you look at the improvement in all the modalities that we have in this day and age, medicines including uh, short-term inhalers and long-term beta agonists and steroid inhaler, um, the only thing that is better than red, red is the IBV or endobronchial valves, and, and the gray is the surgical lung volume reduction in net trial, which is, again, in a very controlled situation. The only thing comes close to or better than that is surgical lung volume reduction. None of the medicines, none of the inhalers, or any other therapy comes close to the effect, the good effects of bronchoscopic lung volume reduction. And as we, as we discussed earlier, <coughs> The, the mechanism of action was it, it causes the collapse of the unhealthy part of the lung, reduces the volume, reduces the hyperinflation and pressure on the lower, healthier part of the lung, allows the lower, healthier part of the lung to expand and compensate for the bad portion of the lung and shifts the VQ in that direction. Uh, again, if you see the... Now, in some patients, we did not see atelectasis. And then the issue was, why are they having benefit? Why are they feeling so much better uh, if they don't have atelectasis? So initially, we thought that atelectasis was a good thing, and we wanted to see in every single patient. So these are the patients who had atelectasis, and they had significantly more improved numbers whether we looked at RB or we looked at FEV1 compared to people who did not have atelectasis. Now we are learning that it's not necessarily so, and I'll show you that in a minute. Again, people who had atelectasis had improved better change or desired change in their TLC compared to people who did not have atelectasis, their FEV1 improved better, and their SGRQs improved better when they had atelectasis. This was um, five years ago. Now, what you, I, I may be the only one who doesn't know, but what is, can you define SGRQ? Oh, it's, uh, it's got a whole table of same respiratory questionnaire, including activities of daily life, uh, cough, shortness of breath and the wake up, uh, able to climb a flight of stairs from their room to bedroom, uh, walk to the to all of those questions. And all of this patient scores then from one to four or five, depending on their minimally symptomatic or very symptomatic. And we have about four or five of these different questionnaires, SF36, San Francisco 36, SGRQ, and a bunch of those. And they, in the end, based on decades of research, have shown to be better than any one or two or three that uh, quality of life measure that patient would have in their mind. Patient, because if you just ask the patient, how do you feel? And they'll say, oh, I feel great because they now are able to go to their bedroom at night without huffing and puffing. And now they don't have to sleep in the recliner in the living room. Uh, but these, all of these series of 20, 30 questions make a better matrix for the quality of life questions. Sorry for that naive question. No, no, it's not. ACT, it's only got five questions, so. <laughs> <laughs> now, in, <clears throat> this, is, this is a very interesting slide, and it took us years to learn this very simple thing. 
Um, when we place the valves in the upper parts of the lung, the um, upper parts started to shrink because there was no air going in. Air was just coming out and eventually most of the air came out. Now, <clears throat> we didn't just, as a result, their total lung capacity didn't just shrink. We were seeing the total lung capacity stay the same because the air was just redirected from upper lobe to lower lobes. Because now, in the same space in the hemithorax, the space is now taken up by the lower lobes, which are compensating for the shrunken or removed upper lobe. So the total lung capacity did not change. However, they improved because now the air that's going in is going into the healthier part of the lung where there's much better gas exchange as opposed to that unhealthy or diseased part. And when we did more calculations with CTs and all the new uh, high-tech softwares to figure out how much air goes from upper lobe to the lower lobe, we figured out that there was approximately 16% decrease in the upper lobe volume uh, and 15% increase in the non-upper lobe volume. So at the end of the day, there was only about 1% change in total lung capacity. But the shift of volume from unhealthy part of the lung to the healthy part of the lung made patients feel great and their other parameters improved, their oxygenation improved. And same thing, we looked at every single patient, we looked at their volumes, shift in volume from upper lobe to the lower lobe, and lo and behold, we found the same thing over and over again. Their lung volumes from the upper lobe went down for the most part, and their lung volumes in the non-upper lobe, means lower lobes or middle lobes, went up. Um, <clears throat> same thing, volume shift. Uh, um, Average volume change in patients who had thermal, uh, who had um, lung volume reduction went down. Upper lobe volumes went down, and the lower lobe volumes went up. This is the same point uh, shown by lung scan that lower volumes go up, upper volumes go down. Now, complications you can imagine were in the airways of the patients. Um, probing and prodding, trying to place these valves, not only one, sometimes four, five, six, seven valves in each lobe. And we would treat both lobes in some patients, so we would end up placing 10 valves in one patient sometimes. So bronchospasm, sometimes a little bit of uh, uh, irritation and bleeding, and sometimes the patient would have such a tribe, they would start coughing and have pneumothoraces. But those were all potential complications we ran into about 2% complication rate of that. But still, if overall, you look at the major mortality and morbidity. So here's the lung volume reduction surgery, not the trial, but in the, in the community. Lung volume reduction trial, net trial, IDV valve trial, both of them. 90 days death. Death in the community is 14 and a half percent, extremely high. And that's why you would not see pretty much anywhere in the United States anybody doing significant amount of lung volume reduction surgery in the community setup, unless they were trained very well uh, thoracic surgeons. Same way, um, if you were, um, even in the trial, expert centers, the skilled surgeons who do all these academic uh, trials, 8% that uh, in 90 days. In IPV trials, none in the last two, last round. The first one, 3.3. Uh, look at the major air leak at one week. 45, 50% of the patients had persistent air leak, means they still had chest tubes after one week of surgery, and chest tube was still bubbling. There was no way the tube was, was going to come out. In our IPV valve trial, after initial learning curve, zero. No, no pneumothoraces, because we learned that we're not supposed to block every single airway going to that lobe. We always leave one tiny air, airway open so that air, air never traps to a point that will pop the lung, will escape through that airway. 
You don't have that option in surgery. Surg in surgery, uh, you just take off the whole bone. And the lung tissue is so damaged that the staple lines never hold very well and they always have fistulas. Um, and cardiac problems, obviously these patients, you know, the, the, we're talking major surgeries, cardiac problems, 20% uh, of the patients in IPV valve trial, the, the next generation trial, uh, we didn't have any complications because these were simple, heavy sedation protocols, quick hour long, hour and a half long procedures, no major trauma, no blood loss, no cardiac. We've got a question here from one of our outside audience. I don't know the answers on this slide. What's the rate of post-obstructive pneumonia in these patients compared to control? So you're comparing different studies here. Is there a control group here? Is this, so the same question, is there a sham bronchoscopy group and a control group? So you will see that in the next several studies that I'll show you in different modalities. But we're talking different modalities. We're talking about spiration valves versus the uh, vent valves or uh, emphasis valves. And they all have different rates of complications, anywhere between initially one, one and a half percent to four, four, five percent. But we were all very, were very much mindful of this potential complication. So we, we gave patients antibiotics before the procedures. We made sure the CTs were clear. So the rates are much less than we all expected. While I've interrupted you, for people listening, we're all aware there's a hum in the sound here and uh, Drew doesn't know what it's from or what to do about it, so um, if you'll just speak as loudly as you can, people are complaining about this hum that outside. Hmm. It's Gary humming. That sounds better. Or my hearing aid turns so up. <laughs> This is another trial it's, um, uh, called Ease Trial. This trial was sort of one of the um, uh, most dangerous trials that I've done so far in COPD management, or emphysema management. The concept here was that, again, a big portion of the lung, whether upper, lower, lower lobe, is hyperinflated because the tissues are damaged in that area, alveolar walls are damaged, and lung has turned into a big um, balloon. Now, this study was one of the few studies that was for homogeneous emphysema, regardless of where the air trapping and dilation, and where is air trapping and ballooning of the lung is, that's where we went. And what happens is when airways, when, when the lung tissue inflate, hyperinflates that much, it, the, the elasticity of the walls has been lost, walls of the airways have been lost just as the elasticity of the original lung tissue. So the airway walls don't hold the airways open, especially the smaller airways. As a result, there is a hyperinflation of the lung tissue, and then there is a closure of the smaller airways through which air was supposed to come out, so air can't go out. So in this study, the hypothesis was if this, again, this is a double-blind, randomized, shame control, no shame control, actually. It is shame control, sorry. The double blind randomized sham control study called Exhale 2 to 1 randomization. And the concept was that if somehow we could bypass that trapped air, get it out of that area, and allow the lung in all those hyperinflated areas to go down and collapse so that the healthier lung would function normally and the excursion of the healthier lung is not compromised. So, what would we do to go into all those small areas? It would be great if we could just go look in the CT and ask our IR interventional radiologist to put needles in every single uh, big bullus of the lung or big hyperinflated area and get all the trapped air out. And it will improve all the mechanics. It will allow the lung to go down and allow the airways to do to function normally and go let, let the air go in and out. So somehow if we could create airway bypass, we would decrease the sense of hyperinflation, improve the respiratory muscle movement, decrease the work of breathing, and improve dyspnea. You know, when I, when I teach medical students to give, them, to give them a good example of what hyperinflation feels like, I tell them to take a breath. And I tell them, do not exhale, hold your breath, and not take another breath. 
and do not exhale, take another breath. This is what the COPDs are doing every day. There's air, that's why their shoulders are like this and they're walking like this because they can't get all the air trapped in their lungs out and they still have to breathe more to get the fresh oxygen. So, Colorado has fresh oxygen. <laughs> you guys may not have that for sure. Um, you can actually buy oxygen when you go hiking in little canisters now. <laughs> Fresh um, so the, the hypothesis, I didn't put the video because it was pretty extensive and we didn't have much time. Um, we went into different parts of the, lung, of the airways. Again, each and every patient got a CT scan. CT determined what were the most damaged areas and chose the airways leading to those damaged areas and literally made a map and marked it and gave it to us. This was a central lab in LA, which looked at all the CT scans for the study purposes. And then we took the map, went to the patient, the patient was intubated, we put ultrasound probe in patient's lungs, Doppler probe, made sure there were no vessels in those areas where we were supposed to make holes. And then we literally poked a hole in the wall of the airway. That was leading to that trapped air zone. And then to keep that hole open to allow all the trapped air to come out, we placed a small stent, uh, which you see in the picture here, in the wall. So we poked the hole, we placed the valve, and this is a newly man-made airway into the lungs of the patient, leading to that air-trapped part of the segment of the lung. And you would, it was pretty amazing that Sometimes we literally heard the air coming out. We would turn off all the things in the, we would even turn off the ventilator in the room for a second. So we could hear the air coming out of their lungs. We would hear the sound, all the trapped air coming out of their lungs, which has been there for months or years. And then their, their chest going down. The biggest concern in this study was making a hole into a blood vessel, which usually rides along there, and that's why we did that. So this is a man-made hole compared to God-made hole in the area. <laughs> What's the drug in it? You said it's drug eluting. Right? It's a drug eluting. It was an antifibrotic agent called... What type of hole? I was actually working on a study. We were, we were making a stance curricula stand for those drugs. Um, I can't remember the name of the drug. Paclitaxel. 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 Pacl
um, as good as we expected, the study was rejected. So if this study is, uh, was a failed study. We don't do it anymore in, or anywhere, not in Europe, uh, where some of the studies did get approval, which were rejected by FDA. This is another very um, a scary looking device called coils. Uh, the whole same concept of placing coils through the bronchoscope. What this does is it loads up straight, I'll show you a video, into the bronchoscope catheter. But when you deploy it into the area of the lung where you want to close off the airway, bronchus, um, it would go and rotate like crazy and cause torsion of the airway, uh, airways leading to that segment of the lung that you want to isolate and you want the ventilation to stop from going down. So now it's starting to make, it, there's a theme here. Block the airway going to the damaged part of the lung, one way or the other. Uh, whether you're placing a valve or a Watanabe spigot or uh, a coil, which is going to go and rotate the airway and cause torsion of the airway. But the goal is to block the airway leading to the damaged part of the lung. And there are two issues there. One, some studies were not successful because there's a collateral ventilation between the lobes. So when you try to collapse the portion of the lung that was damaged, air still came from the neighboring segments of the other lobes, or the same lobe, that's called collateral ventilation. And that put a damper on the whole concept of how much air you're isolating damage, uh, or, just, or take out of the equation. This coil, um, again, uh, um, has the same philosophy. We go into the designated upper parts of the airway, put the coil in there, the coil goes and rotates, and I'll just show you a video without giving you more surprise, more suspense. There you go. So see how it went straight, how it's pulling the lung towards it, tur turning and twisting and tor causing torsion of the airways. So now an airway, which was a straight or very you know, simple turn, is now rotated like this with the coil. And the air cannot go through it. And we see that patients uh, sometimes when you remove surgically a part of their lung and the rest of the lung has to fill up this space. So the airways which were supposed to go down this way are going all up and down because the lung has moved. This is exactly what's happening here. As a result, the air doesn't go through. Now, this study when it started in Heidelberg, Germany, they had a very high rate of pneumothorax because not only this, this coil was causing torsion and rotation of the airway and completely obstructing the airway so no air could come out, but it was also pulling on the tissue of the lung. And this is the tissue of the lung, which is already very damaged in a small person. Now they have modified their curves are less. It's not as strong. And we have now we're learned a lot. In my last two or three slides, you will see that we've gone through this algorithm of which modality is better in which patient now. So we're, it's not just one uh, non-surgical modality. And you can place lots and lots of these valves, uh, these coils in different parts of the lungs and achieve the goal. And you can see in the surgical specimens, uh, the whole portion of the damaged lung is now shrunk to a small piece of tissue. Um, again, the study was done uh, in Germany and other places. Um, this is one of the trials where they make a claim that it's unaffected by collateral ventilation because it not only just twists and turns the airways, but also pulls the muscle, like you know, the scar tissue, up, not muscle, the tissue of the lung. So even if there was ventilation coming through, it won't cause any inflation or movement in the lung tissue. These coils are made of nitinol, so they don't cause too much damage in the lung, and they have similar endpoints like six minute walk, SGRQ, FEV1, and other things. So without going into too much detail, this study is still ongoing and they are seeing significant improvement in the SGRQ in patients who are getting coils compared to non-controls. Uh, 
Um, FEV1 is improving significantly and FEC is improving. The residual volumes are going down and 6 minute clock is improving. So they, they just published this study you know, about a year ago, not even a year ago, um, and it looks promising and they're starting a much larger trial in the United States now and we're one of the centers that will be doing it. Um, this new one is already being now used in the United States. It's a pretty fancy study called biological lung volume reduction. What they do is, again, same concept. You go into the part of the lung where there is a huge damage or bulla, and you block the airway. Now this time, instead of putting a valve or coil, you put a chemical. You put toothpaste in there. And the toothpaste will become solid you have, you have chemically modified the composition, so the toothpaste will become stiff. So first it will be liquid. It will, it's, it's like a, what is that, magic glue or something. It will go in, liquid form, go to smaller airways uh, and collateral uh, pathways, and then it will solidify and turn into a thick paste, and then the airways are completely con uh, blocked. Now the good thing is, since it's liquid, it goes to all these different uh, smaller passages between the lobes and lobe and segments. So it cuts down on all the uh, collateral ventilation. So it doesn't, this collateral ventilation turn into our sort of enemy at one point. And it was undoing everything that we were trying to do. So this is how it comes. It comes, uh, it's loaded into two syringes, two different compounds. And then at the end, they all mix at the tip of the, of the catheter, which is then pushed suddenly, because as soon as they mix with each other, within a few seconds, they solidify. Um, and then this, this, is a, this is called synthetic polymer sealant. It's, uh, it's <coughs> sort of brainchild of a, um, um, his last name was Ingenito. I can't remember his birth name. So it's Dr. Ingenito from Boston who then now is the CEO and president of the company and the main uh, uh, investigator. Their initial study done in Germany by Felix and his group, Felix Hurt, um, and this sh they saw very promising results. Um, again, uh, a concern was that it's an irreversible modality as compared to the valves. So what if somebody develops post obstructive pneumonia or a persistent uh, uh, lung collapse and fistula? They're very careful. So what they do is everybody gets antibiotics. Lung in that area is being lavaged. It is lavaged before the injection of the medicine. The lodges are cultured. So even after you have injected and, and changed the lung into a little ball of solid toothpaste, uh, if somebody has developed pneumonia, you know what those cultures are treating. Um, the studies were done in uh, severe asthmatics. Their RBTLCs improved, their FE1 improved. Uh, so the lungs had significant improvement. Uh, so I'll just run through this real quick. This is the last, is that uh, alarm for me that hour is over? Oh, okay. I thought it was my <laughs> warning time zone. Now there's a hook that comes out. <laughs> I thought it was my chest where or it is. This is a another new modality which is vapor ablation. Where ablation is um, basically you have a little machine that makes a very hot steam. And then you go with this gun which goes to the working channel scope, you go into that segment and you deliver that really hot steam inside the lung, inside the airway, which literally is falls and burns the airway wall and causes scarring. And then in the next 24, 48 hours, <coughs> you see scarring of those airways that goes into that lobe of the lung so that there's no more air going in. So that's an isolated area. You cause severe external inflammation due to heat energy. And this study was done again in seven, uh, nine men, two women. Initial results are promising. They're not seeing any major complications of pneumothorax or other things. Again, these are just one of the, this is just one of several other modalities. So here's the comparison uh, of some of the uh, 
uh, modalities that we have now. We have coils, we have sealants, we have steam or vapor, we have valves um, in non bronch and all of them have some differences which suit one patient versus the other. So patients who have, on the CT scan, if I saw an intact fissure between the lobes, means they have, which tells me that they would not have as much collateral ventilation. Their lung is not damaged enough for communicating to each other as much because the fissures, the pleural fissures, are separating the lungs completely from each other. So that then tells me that I can choose one of the modalities which uh, is hampered by collateral ventilation more than the others since this patient doesn't have much collateral ventilation, for example, uh, respiration valves or ZFR valves, because those, patients, those modalities depend a lot on the absence of collateral ventilation. While the others, like sealants and steam and coils, they don't depend as much on the collateral ventilation because the steam or the sealants or the toothpaste, they just go in their different airways and block up even tiny things. So they're liquid or they're steam. So they go far out and block those dark, small collateral channels between the lobes. And, um, most of the studies are for heterogeneous um, 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 hemphysema, but steam and sealants are for homogeneous. And the big one for homogeneous was the poking holes and making um, man-made airways, which failed. This is, this is a, a, a funny paper I was reading a few days ago from Javier. He's a good friend of ours in um, Madrid. He's the head of pulmonology in Madrid University. Um, so uh, Javier Fernandez wrote a review paper in a Spanish journal. I was lucky to get an English translation of that. So he, he said, based on all the studies that we have done so far where we are today, there are seven lessons that he thinks we have learned. Um, so. Endobronchial valves are great uh, when people have low bar exclusions, good collateral, uh, no significant collateral ventilation, and they have um, heterogeneous emphysema. When possible, do the valves because they're easy to remove. Coils are not easy to remove. The steam and glue are not easy to reverse. And then, uh, Oil vapor do not depend on pulmonary ventilation and do not require complete low bar exclusion. So if patients uh, who have no very good demarcation and, and um, uh, fissures use those technologies. Now you can imagine in terms of coils, coil is pulling on the lung and causing torsion and rotation. You want patients to have some lung tissue. If their lung tissue is completely destroyed, as we say in very medical term, toilet paper lumps. <laughs> uh, we use these very medical term, sophisticated medical terminology that people have toilet paper lumps. So if you put a coil and coil rotated that, they will definitely have a large pneumothorax and perforation of the lung and fistula. So you don't want to use them. Now we actually can tell, our CT can tell the density of the lung, tissue density. And based on that, we can decide the coils are not the best way to go in these patients. Um, patients who demonstrate the best response are those who have higher degree of air trapping. We all know that. Visual volume higher than 225. And FEV funds are very low, and, and their, low, and their uh, diffusion is low. So an emphysema is very homogeneous. Valves don't work very well. Uh, perfusion. Uh, gamography or even a scintigraphy should be done, and then uh, vapors or foams or sealants or uh, gels are the best way to treat them. Thank you very much. I presume none of these are approved in the U.S. yet? No. No, none of them. You're right. They're not approved, but most of them are approved in Europe, uh, and they're uh, undergoing different phases. Some of the studies are in their pilot trials, and some have already gone through pilots and pivotal and going to last major trial before approval. Two questions. Those IVD valves, which seem like the best of everything, uh, at least for uh, heterogeneous lung, are those one size fit all, or do you have multiple sizes? Yeah, good question. They come in different sizes, so uh, anywhere from 5 millimeters to 9. We just stopped 9 company started doing nine a few years ago because um, 
um, the users were getting a little trigger happy and instead of going into smaller airways, they would just block one big airway, uh, which was then leading to pneumothorax because there was no way for air to leak out. Now what we prefer is use smaller airways and then always leave one airway in that lobe open to allow air to leak out. And then with the, the glues or sealants, <coughs> is anybody working on a compound that if you wanted to undo it, there would be some other chemical you could shoot in and unglue it? Yeah, yeah. a bunch of um, people are doing that. Um, the, the, the issue is... Um, all the chemical reactions in the lung, what is the toll of that on the tissue of the lung? Right. Um, but they you know they are, and they have thought about it, um, uh, undoing and dissolving the chemical and suctioning it right back. Yes, sir. Is the, is the collateral circulation um, such that you couldn't just embolize the vessel to the part of the lung and have that part of the lung collapse when there's no more blood supply, or is the VQ mismatching so bad that that's not a real option? Circulation or ventilation? Ventilation. So if you take out the blood vessel, does the lung collapse the same way as if you just obstruct the bronchus? So the blood supply in those damaged parts of the lung is not very much to speak of anyways because there isn't much um, uh, exchange of gases going on there because the, the, the area is so damaged. The air comes in and stays there for a much longer time. All the oxygen gets absorbed. No more fresh air or oxygen is coming in. So since there's not much fresh air or oxygen coming into that part of the lung, blood is not going there because blood follows oxygen. So if you do VQ matches in these people, these damaged areas have very little uh, uh, to offer in VQ mismatch of the entire lung. Now, you could still block off the vessels, and vessels would then uh, redirect the blood to the healthier part. Um, but it would not take care of the mechanical problem that you have, which is the hyperinflated lung, which is pushing down on your healthier lung, which needs space to work and actually work harder than before because now it's got to compensate for a bad lung upstairs. So that's why we take the lung out. Um, now, initial s lung volume production surgery took care of both ventilation and perfusion, but what we learned was that even if you just take care of the ventilation in that dead part of the lung for all practical purposes, the circulation will automatically follow to the healthier part of the lung because oxygen follows the blood. Yes, sir. It's a silly question, maybe, but you know, would the results be different if you do it in, say, in Denver and high altitude versus the lower altitude? Yeah, there is always, yeah. So oxygen requirements are much higher there for people uh, in Denver. But in terms of the procedures, you know. You know, they um, make a I don't know how significant it is because we, we do the baseline measurements and then it's the delta which, which counts between the difference between before and after. So yes, it does. Um, um, I've learned that very hard way, not just the oxygen, but all other technologies that we use. Then it also tends to be extremely dry. And I did my a lot of my rigid bronchoscopy and a stent training in Marseille, which is by the Mediterranean in south of France. So I would put a stand in people there and not worry for years. In Denver, I can leave a stand after two weeks because it gets dry, clogged up the secretions, patient coming. It's the same thing with oxygenation, too. Um, but um, in the studies, it's very well balanced because most of the centers are the lower levels. Uh, and believe it or not, people don't want to move out of poverty. <laughs> In today's changing economics of medicine, is any before any of this gets approved, you have to do a cost analysis of what this caused. And the offsetting thing, I assume, is keeping people out of the hospital with complications of emphysema. Has any thought gone into that equation? Not yet. Um, usually that's the next step uh, after it gets approved, and then we have to have insurance companies pay for it, and they say no, usually. Then we have to show them and everybody else at CMS to get a um, code, a payment CPT code. So we have to prove that it's not only just uh, a right thing to do for patients, like lung cancer screening, but it also is economically sound decision to make. So it will take probably another four or five years before we prove
approved it to CMS or insurance companies. Yes, sir. When you use your bronchoscope, do you get a good enough seal that you could suction down or vacuum down the load that you're trying to obstruct? To some extent, but not as much as um, we would like to because our bronchoscope goes to fifth or sixth generation to the best, and after that there are several more generations of the airways, and when you start playing too much suction, it collapses the airways. The so, yeah. So the best thing to do is to flush saline, rinse that area with the bronchial lavage, and then suck it right back, which is what we do. Well, thank you. I had, yeah, right. personally had no idea how many uh, inventive uh, attempts there are to deal with this on a mechanical basis. Um, so thanks for coming. Sure. Very enjoyable. Thank you. Is there any surfactant left in that area of lung when it's all done? Is there any surfactant left in these areas of lungs that you're working on, or is it all gone by the time the lungs disease at that level? Probably all gone after so much damage to the lung tissue. Because if you look at the surface area of gas exchange in that vicinity's lung, it's dramatically lower than the normal lung because the alveolar walls are damaged. So the way I draw it for medical students and interns is I, I show them a whole bunch of grapes, a bunch of grapes, hundreds of thousands of grapes, or hundreds of grapes in that bunch. And I say, now keep the outer line same, but take off the walls of each and every grape. Imagine how much surface area you are losing per grape. Um, so you may still have a big dilated bunch, outer surface of all the grapes. So you lose the gas exchange surface dramatically, and with that goes all the elastic recoils, surfactant, and everything. I'm well, just seeing that there is much there. If you neutralize the surfactant, maybe the tissue would adhere to itself, and then it would collapse down. Well, that's sort of what the, um, uh, these biological different techniques are doing. I think part of, the, part of what uh, Weber steam therapy does is pretty much the same thing. Which one of these, Steve Freemeyer, a local boy trained here, which one of these is Steve associated with? Steve Freemeyer? Steve Freemeyer was associated with respiration valves. Yeah. Is that still an option on the table? Yes, it's, uh, it's a pretty good option so far. Yeah, it's one of the better options so far. It has gone, gone through more studies uh, than any other modality in the United States. Uh, and they are going to become the leading uh, modality. It's already proof for, um, as I mentioned, you might have to use in Bronco for official. Do you want to get Steve to come up? He used to be my brother in law, so I could call him up. Would <laughs> <laughs> you want Steve to come up? Uh, Talk. Okay. I mean, I think we just heard the whole world's literature on this. Well, so. The other thing Steve's doing, though, is they're using it to reduce lung segments, and they're doing total um, partial volume lung reduction by sucking down the segment, and then they do it thoroscopically instead of through it, uh, opening the chest. So they're taking out sections of the